I'm Dr. Scott Lyons, and you're watching or listening to The Gently Used Human. Have you ever questioned the deep-seated expectations you hold for your children and for yourself as a parent, or wondered how the expectations of your own parents affects you now? There are so many parent experts out there, so which one will actually help you unlock the exact formula for raising strong and resilient kids? In this insightful episode, I'm joined by Dr. Shafali, a renowned clinical psychologist and author known for her groundbreaking work in conscious parenting and family dynamics. Together, we'll explore the impact of societal expectations and social comparisons on parenting, highlighting the importance of focusing on a child's authentic self rather than their external achievements. Yes, we'll delve into the necessity of challenging our biases and judgments and the significance of nurturing a deep-rooted sense of self-worth in both parents and children. Dr. Shafali's profound insights and resources offer a path for parents to embark on a journey of self-healing and conscious engagement with their children. Are you ready for the joy and ease that comes when we let go of control and accept our children for the way they truly are? Let's get this going. Dr. Shafali, welcome to The Gently Used Human. You are such a prolific therapist and author, and it's it's such a a beautiful experience to have you on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I mean, you have three New York Times bestsellers, what an accomplishment, and six books. I mean... You, and you've written about so many important subjects. And one of the ones I really want to dive into with you today is unconscious parenting. And I, I'd love for you just to start with unpacking what is conscious parenting versus other types of parenting? Well, it is a big topic, but yeah. in a nutshell, unconscious parenting is mostly the parenting that you and I probably had to some degree where even though parents can be loving and nice, the focus still is on controlling the child and producing this perfect being or near perfect being to fulfill the parents' fantasies of Mm -hmm. this vision that they had of these children. And Mm -hmm. Embedded in that approach is this idea that the child has to fit in. This child has to be created somehow, be produced into this being that the parent can showcase as their legacy. And conscious parenting that I teach is really about understanding that the child is not here to fulfill your fantasy or to uphold your vision. Your child is here to align with their unique essence. And the more you deviate the child from their unique essence, the more you are actually creating or helping create within the child this egoic false self that we really had in our lives. And we don't want to do that to our children. We want our children to, as close as possible, live aligned to their own authentic nature. And Mm -hmm. that is the mission of conscious parenting. But of course, the parent can only do that when the parent is willing to shed their obsessive attachment to their own vision of who their children should be and instead align with their child's vision for themselves. And of course, the parent guides the child and, you know, is there, but is there with a very different energy, with a very different intention. Hmm. I love that. And how is it that you co-discover the the child's essence of who their authentic being is? Well, you do that first when you have come into a surrender of your own authentic essence. You see, if you're not in touch with your bejeweled essence, you will Mm -hmm. not hold on to it, you know? You will not think it's something to value. So it's those parents who come upon their own 
essence and have fought for it. Those yeah. parents are not going to steal and abduct another's essence because they've hard won their own essence. So first is, yeah. is the parent being in touch with their own essence. And then yeah. you, you, you trust, you trust that the child will bloom into their own essence if they are allowed to. So mm. the parent who understands the value of that process waits yeah. and allows and gives space mm. and trusts that whatever comes forth is worthy and doesn't have to look this picture perfect way, produced mm. way that culture tells us our children need to look like. So it takes a mm. tremendous gumption from the parent to allow that. And it takes a spiritual seeker, a parent who's on a spiritual path, who understands that we're not here to design this child's life. We are here to allow the child's essence to unfold. It's a very different mm. energy with which the parent interacts with the child with. Yeah. I think I have a pretty good sense of what you mean, the authentic essence but how do we kind of operationalize that? Is there like, like, are we, are we looking for qualities? Are we looking for like personality types? What is it that we might be looking for when we're discovering that with them and holding space for that authenticity or that essence? So my latest book, uh, The Parenting Map, really lays out the different qualities and temperaments, typical ones that our children yeah. fall into. You know, is your child more an anxious kind of explosive child? Is your child more a dreamy, reclusive child? Is your child more shy? Is your child more rebel? So I list out the archetypes that I have typically found common in children. And hmm. what I'm encouraging parents to do is not typecast their children, but instead yeah. really tune in to the essence. And children show us the essence so clearly it's we who fail to listen. It's we who fail to honor uh, because mm -hmm. we are so hell bent on a very particular type of image. You know, for yeah. example, the other day a, cl a client came to me crying, you know, really in mm -hmm. sorts because her child was too shy and her child was mm -hmm. withdrawn. So she kept pushing her child to be less shy and withdrawn, but then the child was getting more anxious and was getting more withdrawn. Mm. So in these ways, we are always kind of curating our children and making them into these museum products that is really yeah. not their essence. So I'm so curious because so much of your work is around children and, and parenting. Can you take me through a little bit of your personal journey from like, what were you like as a child into your journey of becoming a parent? Well, I think, you know, from an early age, I was very, you know, being a sensitive person like you, I'm sure. Yeah. We are natural empaths and feel the mm. pain of the world, you know. So from a young age, I was very attuned to children and uh, mm. my, my friends and se very sensitive to the underdog. And I yeah. made it, a, a, you know, a promise to myself that I would be a teacher of some sorts. I mm -hmm. always wanted to help, to teach. And I think it just was very natural to me to then study psychology and focus on children. And as I began working with people and adults, I began to see how their pain was so mm -hmm. rooted in their childhood. And then I began to excavate more, like, what is it? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was entering a very deep spiritual inquiry into the meaning of life and began meditating very deeply, going for retreats, mm -hmm. understanding the false self. And then mm -hmm. as I continued my spiritual practice, I began to see that the parent's false self was really the obstructor of their child's true self. And mm -hmm. that was the cause of all our problems. Like it began in mm -hmm. childhood. And then when mm -hmm. I became a parent, 
I saw how my false self was blocking my child's true self and how Mm. upset I was that my child wasn't who I wanted her to be in my fantasy. And my Mm. child really was the final linchpin on my spiritual explosion and got me to see, wow, even though I'm a spiritual practitioner, I have so much ego. I have so much expectation. Mm. I have so much fantasy. And my child was so different from me temperamentally that we were Mm. clashing. Mm. And had I not been on a spiritual path, I would have just punished her or yelled at her or blamed her. But because Mm. I had been on a spiritual path, I was able to see, ah, I'm not accepting my child right now, not because of anything wrong with my child, but because I was so deeply attached to my false self. So it all kind of exploded together in this perfect storm, which then, you know, made me so aware of how Mm. the parental ego is really the cause of all suffering, really, because our ego creates the child's ego. The child's ego creates a disconnection from itself, from each other, from the earth. And if only we could create homes or families or parents that had a deep attunement to their children, children would grow up less violently abducted from themselves and therefore Mm -hmm. less violently abducting of others, you know? Mm -hmm. So that abduction happens in early childhood. And if we could nurture that parent-child connection more deeply, I believe we could replenish the earth. So that that's how it all kind of, pioneered this movement of conscious parenting. And now conscious parenting is a movement. And Mm -hmm. there's so many people out there doing this. I have an institute. I train hundreds of people every year to become ambassadors of this message, just like I am. Mm. Mm. When you talk about your false self that was displayed or showed up so clearly in relation to your daughter, could you say, share us, with us more about like how did that false self present itself and when your daughter was a mirror to that what happened to that false self yeah so my my nature as everyone's nature is a Uh core essence but we then are forced to either exaggerate that essence or give up that essence for a false self. So in my life, in my particular essence, it was a good girl. I was always a pleaser. I was always sensitive. That is my essence. But I exaggerated that to a toxic level of being a people pleaser, being compliant, being servile. That was the exaggerated version of my essence. So now in my parenting, I wanted my child to be that servile, compliant, good girl that Mm. I had adopted. And Mm. she wasn't. She was wild. She was a rebel. She was brash. She was loud. And that bothered me because I had so honed this good girl image that Mm. her not being that upset me. So that's how it clashed. So if I had been unconscious, I would have buried her and punished her. But because I was semi-conscious, I was able to Mm -hmm. see the clash and go, oh, what is wrong with me? My child is showing me that actually I'm in false self, not she, I'm in false self. So she actually liberated me to allow me to realize that I had overblown my essence to this toxic degree. And I needed to shed that. I needed to let it go, not that she needed to become me, you know? What was that shit? So that took a few years. I had already messed her up. I was going to say, (laughs) (laughs) that it took a few years to realize that or for you to shed it? Both. It took me, first I thought I was so perfect, (laughs) but but her ability to stay Mm -hmm. in her essence and my ability to let her in a way, you know, I tried to fake punish her, but I was not really doing a good job because I was already on a spiritual path. So I already knew I was full of shit. And that's the beauty of, (laughs) that's the beauty of a true spiritual path. A true spiritual path teaches you to have beginner's mind, which means, Hey, start again, question everything, 
don't think you're amazing. You know, it, it has no compunction in saying, Hey, you're full of shit. That's really a spiritual warrior. A spiritual warrior is willing to say, I'm, you know, acting right now. Full of shit. (laughs) I'm full of shit. I'm acting. (laughs) I dare myself to go deeper. A spiritual seeker doesn't act as if they know everything. You know, so whenever people come to me and they say, Dr. Shivali, I'm a conscious parent. I go, oh my goodness, you're so not, right? That is so, <laughs> so the antithesis of a spiritual yeah. seeker. A spiritual seeker says, I know nothing. I am nothing. I Please blast me. Please take my clothes off because I want to be disheveled. I want to be discombobulated. I want to start at zero. That is the sign of a true spiritual seeker. So people who go, I am amazing, or I'm the best parent, that is full of ego. That is not yeah. the sign of a spiritual seeker. So yeah. I think I'd love to just normalize something that I'm sure in addition to that, that we both have seen in our own practice, which is I've had so many par- I every parent who's ever come in, because I used to work in pediatrics too, and then shifted to the big kids, which is the adults. <laughs> And every parent who's ever come in has said to me, they're like, I, I, I'm so embarrassed to say this, but I think I'm a horrible parent or I don't know what I'm doing. I assume everyone else knows what they're doing. Right. And I was like, I don't think so. Like, I, I think we get to normalize this in a big way that like my mom used to say something to me. She was like, what do you want me to do? There was no handbook. And I was like, right. well, Dr. Shafani wrote a, surely wrote a handbook. If there are handbooks, but but at the same time, I, I really honor like it. It is. It's a big abyss about how to do this. How to be? There's guide points, but it's really not yeah. easy. Yeah. It, you know. And so first, yes, we don't know what yeah. we're doing. We're clueless, and it should be normalized. <laughs> it's it is the hallmark of a conscious parent. The yeah. ability to say, I don't know what I'm doing. Because now doing. you're open. Yeah. Now you're humble. Mm. Now you're willing to learn, right? And that's why I wrote this book called The Parenting Map, because I wanted to yeah. give parents yeah. the handbook. Now, yeah. if we were raising children with hunter-gatherer energy, we wouldn't yeah. need to know because the community handles it. There is no school. There is no reading, writing. There is no achievement. And it's, it's yeah. the best way to parent. And in that society, you don't need a handbook. And it is more yeah. intuitive because it's less ego. There's no ego there. You know, I just was in Africa. I spent time with a hunter gatherer community mm-hmm. and the children were fine and they didn't have mm-hmm. toys and they didn't have, you know, all these fancy things and museum classes in a museum and trips to fancy countries and they were okay. But now because we live in a world full of ego and achievement and excessive doing, this is why we need to accept that this way is not the way because children are getting lost here and there's so much pressure on them to be something other than who it is they are. That's why we need to go back to the basics and that's what my books and my teachings espouse. I want to take a moment to give a loud shout out to The Embody Lab, which is one of the most incredible resources for body-based and somatic therapies. This show is all about healing, and The Embody Lab does exactly that. Whether you're on your own journey of transformation and discovery or enhancing your skill sets in your career as like a coach or a therapist, a body worker, or really any career where you are supporting other gently used humans, the Embody Lab is your place for deep, inspiring, and impactful workshops, certificates, masterclasses, and an incredible community of like-minded folks. I love the Embody Lab, and so do so many other people that call it a platform to come home to over and over again. The Embody Lab is giving my listeners an exclusive offer, a one-time 10% off code to enhance your embodied well-being. 
All you have to do is go to theembodylab.com and use the code GENTLYUSE10 at checkout. So I want to chat about one of the, the the nuances and complexities of child psychology, which is like there are lots of people who have different maps or ideas of parenting. And so I want to you know first talk about that, but also talk about like how do, does this theory or this approach kind of cross culture? Like, you know, is there a universal approach to parenting or do we say this works in this very westernized culture or where does it best fit? Well, so the premise of what I teach is that the parent needs to heal themselves. If the mm. parent is coming from unhealed places and brokenness, yeah. they are then yeah. going to use this child to fulfill yeah. their fantasies. They're going to use yeah. this child to complete themselves. You know, yeah. Every day, I have a 21-year-old, I have to be conscious of how I'm trying to make her what I want, to make me feel yeah, good yeah. about myself, right? Yeah. Just the other day, we had a huge debate, really an argument, and she yeah. refused to bend to my will, right? So yeah, I had yeah. to see myself deal yeah. with that ego rejection. But a yeah. part of me was so thrilled that she knew who she was, but my mm. ego didn't like that she wasn't following me because our children deserve to live lives that are unobstructed by parental ego, by parental tradition, by parental expectations. I mean, I know in my own life, I have rebelled against my parents and I've become a better human being because of that. I've disrupted mm. family generational patterns and I'm better for that. And I think every child deserves that freedom to explore their own destiny and to have the space to defy their parental, generational, ancestral legacies. And they shouldn't feel bad or guilty for doing that. Mm. I wonder if that's kind of a coming of age is to be a disruptor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It should be. And I think <laughs> parents, parents, parents should allow that space you know, so when I see my daughter fight with me and argue with me and tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, I could take it personally and get into my yeah, feelings. Yeah. Or I could yeah. take it like, oh, that is so natural that she's flexing her own muscle, that she's spreading her own wings and she's mm. discovering who she is. So that's mm. really what I encourage parents to do is, is give children the space and allow children to discover themselves because that self-discovery and that self-awareness is much more estimable than a degree at an Ivy League school. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just want to say, I, I appreciate so much your vulnerability and sharing your own process and your own process and challenges of parenting. I mean, I think it's easy for people to pedestal you as like this person who's figured out how parenting does or how we do parenting well or best and and to and to really humanize yourself in this way to say like it's still a shit show sometimes and in my own mind and my own ego and the battle between what i care about and what i consciously work towards and the parts in me that like that feel threatened or challenged by that still yeah yeah, yeah. and you know I don't look at it as being vulnerable or brave. Oh, I just look really? at it as the fact of it, you know. So any parent yeah. who doesn't have a battle between their ego and their real self yeah. is lying. because yeah. our that, And that's the beauty of children, yeah. authentic children, children who've been allowed to express. They are going to fight back and tell you, you don't know what you're talking about. So for parents who come and tell me that they never argue with their children or their children and they have this amazing connected relationship, I tell myself, oh, somebody's lying, you know, somebody's bullshitting yeah. because there's yeah. no such thing. Any honest relationship, especially yeah. from older generation to younger generation, is going to have disruption. And that's yeah. honest. You know, yeah. maybe in our generation, 
generation to the same generation, we may not have as much disruption. But yeah. I mean, every other day, my daughter's telling me I'm out of touch and I don't know what I'm talking. <laughs> every other day. And I go, wow, I think I'm pretty in touch. But I love yeah. that she says I'm out of touch because she's not, you know, here to just agree with me and roll over. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. the way it should be. And each generation needs to challenge each other. And I keep challenging her and she keeps challenging me. And I think that's mm -hmm. healthy. So for yeah. any parent-child dynamic that is not challenging each other is not yeah. being honest, you know? Yeah. It, it goes towards that saying that like growth and development happens also through tension. Yes. And yes. conflict. And as opposed to like growth and development isn't, oof, it's not just a peaceful emergence. It, it, it's really kind of internally and sometimes externally violent. Yeah. And it can be, so on one end, violent, on, on, yeah. on one end, very painful, in the middle, yeah. tense, but at <laughs> least through contrast, yeah. right? We know yeah. that growth will not happen without contrast. It has mm. to happen through a shock or an exposure, right? Even yeah. if it's just a little bit, it has to happen through some agitation. And then mm -hmm. big change, big transformation mm -hmm. happens through some death, right? Death of yeah. the old self. So yeah. along that continuum, it doesn't always have to be violent or divorce or a lo loss of a life or a job, mm -hmm. but no. it has to happen through some challenge, through some exposure, yeah. through some contrast, at the very least. Yeah. And that doesn't mean we need to seek the, a challenge or seek conflict in order to grow either. <laughs> but it does happen as part of the organic nature of yes. evolution. Yes. I mean, if you go to hear a speech, right, you're going mm -hmm. to be moved by somebody who pushes you a little bit, who inspires mm -hmm. you, not just somebody who who says it exactly the same way you've been saying it to yourself. You want, yeah. you want someone to speak your language, but they must also take you a few degrees out of your comfort zone. That is a true yeah. teacher, right? Yeah. And, and yeah. And as I'm hearing you talk about your daughter and I hear her as a teacher, cause she's also yeah. sounds like she's taking you, she's pushing you towards, yeah. she's a mirror and pushing you a little bit outside the comfort zone. Yes, as most kids too. Day, <laughs> right, yeah. right. Because at the end of the day, every human is asking the other human to yeah. accept them for who they are. And we don't yeah. like that. We're like, no, no, I don't, you're wrong. Like even somebody yeah. with the, with the most disp disparate social political yeah. views, yeah. you are forced at the end of the day to say, okay, I love you. I accept you. And I just have to surrender to you and I disagree with you. Right. Yeah. So it's that ability to say, I see you. I understand what you're trying to say and I still disagree. Now that would yeah. make for a new earth. Right. Yes, it would. Yeah. And it reminds me of like so much of like when we're talking about working it with couples, like you can't love someone for their potential. And I really hear you saying that in terms of being a parent, you can't love your child for the potential of who they could be or, or yes. how you might get them to that, but to meet them. Yeah. yeah. Don't tell your child, Oh, you're not living up to your potential. That's such a load of bullshit <laughs> because we are all then, you know, if, if you start decides what my potential yeah. is, right. And then you're yeah. like, Oh, Dr. Shifali, your interview, you know, it could have been so much more. It just wasn't your potential. I'll be so mad at you. I'll be like, how so do you rude. know who I am? That's so rude, right? Yeah. But you're going to be yeah. like, oh, but I see more for you and I see you <laughs> in a better way. And I'm like, no, just see me for who I am, okay? Yeah. And love me and yeah. celebrate yeah. me right here, right now. So parents yeah. are always yeah. bullshitting, you know, telling their, their children, you're not living up to your potential. <laughs> That's just another <laughs> way of saying, I don't like who you are right now. Can you be better? Yeah, yeah. Oof, that's, that's hard. That's painful. And then we internalize it as kids. And it's just like, I mean, it's meant to be a growth statement. It's meant to be something that pushes us, but it's often something that brings us down. I mean, come on. If you threw a dinner party and I come and tell you, at, you know, the next day, it was good, but you know, I don't think it was your full potential. <laughs> no one wants to be, you know, graded and critiqued. No. 
and no. objectified in that way. We want people no. to say, it was amazing. I loved you for it. And it was good enough. And yeah. then that, you know, in, in a very counterintuitive way, gives me the confidence to become mm. better. I don't mm. always want to be told what I'm yet not. I want to be yeah. told yeah. that I was awesome. And, and it doesn't mean that you have to give platitudes, but it also yeah. doesn't yeah. mean that you have to keep, you know, critiquing people. Mm. So what is the pathway towards, I don't know if we call it gentle feedback, <laughs> and without trying to change or tell or demonstrate show someone's misses or their lack uh, between yeah, a parent I think, and child. I think the first place is to check in with mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. for example, if your child is, you know, uh, overweight or mm -hmm. if your child is too introvert or whatever, too something, mm -hmm. okay? Do something, something. Where, you're, where you're now getting uncomfortable, right? Mm -hmm. My child is too loud. My child is too soft. My child is too fat. My child is too thin. My child is too this. My child is, okay, whatever the two is. You've decided it's a yeah. two. So you have to first check in with yourself about your judgment and mm -hmm. ask yourself, is this judgment my bias coming from my wound? Because I think da-da-da or I'm conditioned to da-da-da or is it kind of objective? And mm. just that question will make you realize that it's your judgment, right? Most things yeah. are your own conditioning, your own judgment. Yeah. What is too shy? What is too loud? What is too dramatic? What is too emotional? Now, too fat, too thin, maybe there's some numbers, okay? But, but very few things are very objective. Mm. And you have to, you have to really dig deep within yourself and go, where is this judgment coming from? Why am I uncomfortable? Right. So the other day, a parent came to me and said, you know, my child, my, this was a 16 year old girl. My child mm -hmm. is always wearing these, you know, really slutty clothes, you know, like she's mm -hmm. showing too much skin. So we deconstructed that, you know, maybe yeah. the parent was right, but maybe we need to examine what are these definitions? What is a slut? Who is a slut? What is too much? What mm -hmm. is too little? So yeah. I first challenge parents to really ask themselves, what their own conditioning is, what their own bias is. And very often through that process, they realize, oh, they better shut up. <laughs> you know, they have, they have to work on their own stuff. They got to work you on know, their own emotional parent, needs. Right. Yeah. Suppose the parent says, you know, my child's grades are not good. Okay. Then we yeah. examine, yeah. okay, you know, what is objectively a bad grade? Why are we so mm. scared? Oh, because my child isn't getting A plus plus. Okay. Is that, yeah. is that a reasonable goal for your child? Is that a reasonable expectation for your child's genetics and motivational level? Mm. You know, yeah. I know what my child can naturally achieve. Do you, are you pushing mm. your child too much? So this yeah. is the kind of inquiry that a conscious yeah. parent goes through. And most parents don't want to go through this inquiry because it's too much work. It's too uncomfortable. Yeah. It's yeah. too yeah. rigorous. Yeah. Well, your child deserves that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know it's hard to the exhaustion of, of many sleepless nights or, you know, all of that, but the, I really hear how important it is, if you can, to muster the energy, to put it towards first yourself in a way, put the mask on your face in the airplane, so to speak, first, breathe, connect to yourself, and then be able to really support from that. Right. And, and then put yourself really in your child's shoes, you know. Yeah. How would you like to hear this feedback from your best friend? Would that yeah. make you want to be better or makes you want to run away and hide? So you have yeah. to be intentional about your feedback. Now, listen, again, if we yeah. were living with the hunter-gatherers around a fire where there were no toys, no school, no, half the pressure is off. There is no pressure for yeah. the child yeah. to be any particular way. So... Yeah. Right there, the conditioning is so much less. All of this is necessary because we're living in a stupid, artificial, crazy, insane world, you know, oh where God. the child is thrust into artificial situations that they should not be thrust into, right? Yeah. No, like, you know, no 12-year-old should be thinking about what kind of gown they need to wear for their bat mitzvah, you know? That in itself is like, 
insanity, right? Why are we having all these big pomp and circumstance or the 16-year-old or the quinceanera, you know, whatever, the 15-year-old in Mexico or, or, uh, or the child so petrified in high school about which mm. Ivy League school they're going to get into in college. You know, hunter-gatherers did not think like that. So now we've created this society where we're comparing each other on social media, where we're talking about millennials, you know, are talking about getting Botox at the age of 25. I mean, it's just so insane. That's why we have to be conscious because we've become so unconscious, you see? I do. I feel it. I feel it. This show is also brought to you by the absolutely stunning and powerful tools of transformation that are created by Omala. Oof, even the name Omala transports you to a place of flow and vitality. These are some of my favorite products ever. They have an amazing color-changing yoga mat that responds to your temperature and presence and reflects back your posture in real time. There's this incredible smelling skin balm candle that heats up to activate all the essential oils and vitamins that your skin has been craving. I mean, look, if I could live in a giant bath of this candle, I would 100% do it. They also have these journals that lead you into profound insight, and then you get to plant those journals to create a stunning flower garden. What? I mean, if that's not deep and inventive, I don't know what is. If you're someone who desires to live a luxurious flow of life and who believes in transformative wellness, then you have to check out Omala. Omala is giving my listeners an exclusive discount to treat yourself to something that is as special as you, boo. All you have to do is go to omala.com, that's O-M-A-L-A.com, and use the code Dr. Scott 10 at checkout. And a portion of every purchase goes to an incredible charity. You got this. I remember 15 years ago when I worked in with, with little kids, like neonates, and I had a, a, a parent bring in a three-month-old. And I was like, well, what brings you in? And she was like, we just heard you're really helpful and you know how to like help with developmental movement to support their brain. And we really want our child to get into Harvard. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> I was like, why don't we just get to crawling first? <laughs> and then maybe in 18 years, right. worry about where they're going to school. I'm right. like, wow. But there's a survival mechanism that if I do, if they don't get this, if they don't get this very essential thing in the first three months, if they're not doing these developmental reflexes, then it leads to a life where they don't get into an Ivy League, where they fail somehow, even though there's plenty of experiences of people never going to college and succeeding and, or yeah. not going to Ivy, you know, all of that. But it's like such an urgency and a fear that's yeah, so prevalent. Yes, you're right. It's all fear-based because yeah. the parents have bought into this idea that this yeah. child needs to be this emblem of perfectionism yeah. and happiness yeah. and success. So yeah. the parent has bought into that movie and now wants yeah. to typecast, you know, screencast this child into this projection of what they believe will be a happy life. And the child hasn't even spoken yet or the child hasn't even <laughs> crawled yet. You know, yeah. and what, what I've come to see, and I'm sure you've come to see is yeah. what screws a child up and what screws an adult up is not yeah. their MD degree and not their, their super skinny body. What screws them up is their lack of connection to themselves and yeah. their lack of worth. Right. Yeah. And if the child doesn't have that, the yeah. rest is just false embellishments that come to nothing. So yeah. what a parent needs to give the child is a deep-rooted sense of I'm good enough. Yeah. What the child does with that is the child's own manifestation. But we yeah. focus yeah. on the wrong thing and yeah. we mess it up. 
And actually, if we just focused on you're good enough, parenting becomes so easy. Mm. But if we're focused on making a museum piece out of our child, like a, an iconic, yeah. you know, Olympian, then we're going to be exhausted. Yeah. See, I'm not invested yeah. in my child being anything. So because mm. I know that that accolade needs to be given to myself. But most yeah. parents are using their children to feel good about themselves. Yeah. Right? So mm. that's why it's it's a, a lose-lose situation. Yeah. Then the relationship is transactional as opposed to something that's bidirectional and growing and evolving. And easy. Parenting should be really mm. quite easy if we mm. parents got out of our own way, you know, but mm. our ego is doing the parenting. And that's why it's mm. so difficult because you've decided yeah. as a parent that you need to teach the child 16 languages and take them to 16 countries <laughs> before they're 16 years old. And they need to be exposed to every bloody thing in the world. So go ahead, yeah. you know, break a leg, go ahead, spend all your money on rubbish and yeah. be broke and miserable. And your child won't be self-worthy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I really, I mean, I so appreciate it, especially I know both of us have, have had our hands full in our life of studying child psychology. And there's so many theories that focus, here's what you do with this child. If they behave this way, this is what you say and do. Right. But what you really offer into the world is saying, actually, when we, when we complete the parent and help them find their wholeness, that transmits into the, the environment, the ecosystem, the child, and wholeness becomes the, the foundation of, of embodiment, the foundation of, the, we, they can't not be more whole because of that. Yeah. I mean, imagine, you know, growing up feeling like you're good enough. And, <laughs> I you know, love that. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I can hear parents say, oh, yeah. then. My child will just be sitting on a couch, lazy, <laughs> or a drug dealer, or, or a criminal, or a rapist. And I go, how did mm. that happen from <laughs> you just <laughs> loving your child as they are? Like, how did you go to sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and prison, you know? How did that, because, the, the, because parents go, oh, you want me to stop controlling my kid? Oh, then the only yeah. resort left for my kid is that they're going to be a pedophile, right? Like, how does yeah. that happen in the mind of the parent? Because the it parent really, really doesn't, under yeah. doesn't understand, you know, psychology, that when a child yeah. feels safe, seen, yeah. held, yeah. secure, they're going to be inherently good people, you know? Yeah. You don't have to din the fear of heaven and hell and, you know, into your child for them to be good people. But we have such a fear-based, scarcity-based mentality that I understand because we were conditioned that way. We were conditioned yeah. through fear and control. So now we think that's yeah. the only way to control others. We control our partners. We control our bodies. We control our every moment. We stopped living in joy and in presence because we are so obsessively trying to control everybody around us. Yeah. What? Thank you for naming that because it's so true and it needs to be said so clearly that it's this, again, it's that reverse of instead of putting so much pressure and attention on the child, what can we do for ourselves or what can we do as parents or uncles or community members to support the development of this child by looking at us? And I'd love to just leave folks with some kind of some of your most powerful tools for you and, and what you've found with other parents of just coming home and healing that inner child or the thing that's been left behind in this, in the parent? You know, I always tell parents that if you really want to be the best parent, you know, heal yourself. Yeah. And yeah. you can't just listen to a podcast. You have to kind of go on this spiritual quest. So, you know, my, this book, The Parenting Map, lays out 20 steps to heal yourself, really. Love and that. to show up differently, but you're going to have to read the book. There's exercises here. There's examples, there's practice. It's not something sadly that we can just switch on and off. We have to develop because we've now indoctrinated ourselves in an insane world where we are all so disconnected, really, that we need to go back 
to a new way of living and learn and cultivate. So I teach this. I teach courses. I have an institute. I have books, six books. I've had to learn, you know, I can't just decide. And, and I can't tell you the exponential gifts I've been given through this mm. path of self reflection, self healing. It's the greatest gift you can offer to your children and to your partners, to your friends is your healing. And that's what I mm. teach in my, in my work. Beautiful. And where can people find more of your work, your website? We'll put it in the show notes, but I, w I want them to hear it from you too. Well, you know, my Instagram is Dr. Shefali, D-O-C-T-O-R, doctor spelled out Shefali. And my website is dr for Dr. Shefali.com. But yeah, I have so many courses. I have so much free stuff on, on YouTube and Instagram. And I have an institute, really, if people want to do this as a living, as a career. I coach you how to become a coach like me. And there's nothing more rewarding, really, than helping others grow. Amazing. Thank you for doing so much good in the world. Thank you and for having thank me. You for, yeah, thank you for joining us on the Gently Used Human. And for all those who listen, thank you for tuning in. And definitely check out Dr. Shafali's work. It's, it's really a game changer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Gently Used Human podcast with Dr. Scott Lyons and friends. Visit GentlyUse.com for fun extras, including submitting your questions for advice from a Midwestern mom. And don't forget to spill the tea and gossip about the show with all your friends and frenemies. And you know what? Show us some love by giving us five stars and leaving a review in your favorite apps. This helps us connect with all the other gently used humans out there. Oh, and by the way, you look fierce today.